In our first episode, I have decided to drive down to the south of Honduras, which lies within the Dry Corridor. The Dry Corridor is a space that stretches from Nicaragua to Guatemala, and is a space that incurs heavy droughts during the summer, and is plagued by food insecurity as a result. The climate effect of El Nino, which causes extreme heat and weather conditions, is predicted to disproportionately set in this year. I drove down south from San Pedro Sula to Choloteca, which is an area that is wedged between El Salvador and Nicaragua, and has reportedly been heavily affected by droughts and heavy rainfall. In the small community of San Bernardo, I met Modesto Ochoa, who is not only a prominent community leader in the area, but also the president of Codefa Golf, the largest environmental organization in the southern regions of Honduras. He welcomed me into the house of his sister, who told me that her crops had been lost this year due to the heavy rainfalls in the winter season and that she is unsure how to feed her family throughout the very dry summer that is about to come. A small pile of corn that was lying in front of her house had been donated by some of her neighbors who witnessed her struggles. However, she says that the small amount will most likely not be enough for the summer, which she hopes will be mild this year. Later on, Modesto took me to a meeting of the Fishermen's Union, which allows fishermen and community leaders from all communities relying on fishing to come together and discuss one central question. The access to water and shrimp deposits, which remain critical for the communities to survive. Shrimp fishing, especially in the lagoons, has become the backbone of many communities who have lived for generations from eating and selling shrimp. Now, not only has the price for shrimp rapidly declined after the arrival of large corporations who are now artificially farming shrimp in the region, but as well, less and less lagoons have become fishable due to the early onset of droughts throughout the years. Armidia Lisette showed me one of the lagoons that was quickly drying out. She estimates that it will completely disappear by the end of December. She says that usually the lagoons don't dry out until the next year, but particularly this year, the droughts has set in very early. Her community relied on the shrimp deposits in this lagoon, but soon will have nowhere to fish. Modesto took me to another lagoon, one of the larger lagoons several communities depend on equally. He says by the end of this year, this lagoon will have completely dried out and the extreme heat has already turned what was once the sand bed of the lagoon into a hard crusty surface. The crust is so hard that it makes a crackling sound when walking on it and feels a bit like walking on cardboard. A little bit north of Choluteca I stopped by a cattle ranch that was set beside the street. Tito Argueta quickly welcomed me and showed me around. He tells me that in his 30 years of being a cattle farmer he has noticed the slow change for the worse. Now every winter, every summer, he has to account for a loss of his cattle. Either they drown or get stuck in the mud and suffocate through the heavy rains in the winter, or they die by a lack of nutrition and especially water during the heavy droughts of the summer. He is considering to sell his land and move further north since he is seeing this development turning worse and worse each year. His ranch is the only one with a deep well that provides access to water for his cattle. However, each summer the well dries up and the farmers have to rely on alternative methods to keep the livestock alive. Throughout the years, farmers in the south have adapted to this new reality and are now using a fruit called hikaro to feed the cattle during the extreme heat in the summer. The fruit has a slimy consistency which is extracted and serves as a substitute for regular food and water. The trees can withstand the extreme heat, but often it is not enough to feed all the livestock and according to Tito, a lot of his livestock dies during this period. Further down south I came across a field where a bunch of day laborers were harvesting and packaging corn into large sacks. They were eager to share that this corn harvest had rather been mild since the corn had not fully grown and remains rather small during the harvest. 66-year-old Jose Salvador has been working these fields since he's been a little boy and tells me that this harvest is only for the communities so they can stockpile for the dry summers. The extreme weather conditions in the winter have drowned his crop so this harvest is critical for the communities to survive the summer. One of the day laborers I met there was 21-year-old Hector Mauricio. He tells me that he has thought about leaving for the US many times since many of his friends have already done it. 
However, what is holding him back is the high price to pay to a smuggler to bring him across the border, so he's currently trying to save up 16,000 US dollars for the extremely dangerous route up north. Though I expected to only find extreme droughts, I learned that not only droughts but extreme weather conditions in both winter and summer have augmented through climate change and affected food security in the region on a devastating scale. The people in these communities have shown extreme resilience but also a clear nexus between the rapidly changing climates and migratory movements due to the extreme lack of food security. Something I will follow up on soon.